Hi, it's Jory with Taitland Studios. Welcome back to another episode, and today we're going to be going over milling lumber. I work with some other local woodworkers on manufacturing kitchen tables, benches, and some desks. And um, when that lumber first comes in, we need to mill it down to a workable state. So often when the boards are cut down at, at the mill, they are often in just a rough format. So they're just run through the saw and they're cut and the surfaces are just left bare. So what that is called is just rough lumber. And um, when it goes through the drying process, often those boards will twist a little bit, crack a little bit, and there's a bunch of different defects in the wood that the milling process takes out so that we do have uh, flat surfaces. Generally, when you buy lumber, it's gonna be in three different states. It's either rough lumber, S2S, or S4S. Now, rough is self-explanatory. It's basically cut at the mill, and then it's dried, and then it's shipped. The next is S2S, where they will surface two sides. And lastly is S4S, where they surface all four sides of the board. Now, today we're working with uh, rough pine. So that's going to, of course, need to be milled. And then we're also working with alder, which is S2S. Now, the alder that we have isn't the best job of getting milled down. So I will need to correct that. But there is generally less work involved. Now, the reasons why you might not just go straight for S2S or S4S is because sometimes you have to mill it, but also it is more expensive because right from the manufacturer, they are doing more work on it, putting in more labor, so the cost does increase. So if you're like me and many other woodworkers, you have a jointer and a planer, and uh, what that'll do is just surface those sides to save you a bit of money, but you have to put in more labor yourself. So... We'll just go over the process of getting set up right now. Before I get started, I like to get some rollers set up on both the in feed and the out feed side of the jointer. Now I like to do that because as I'm bringing long boards over say seven or eight feet long, I'll often be struggling to hold that up for that whole time. And because this will probably take a day to do all that lumber, I wanna reduce the amount of strain on my shoulders as possible and keep the workflow going. So. Yeah, I just usually set it two to three feet back, so that'll give plenty of support. And then as I'm running through the boards, I'll have that support almost the entire time. When you're about to start jointing your boards, you need to be conscious of the defects that the board has. So for example, this board has some twisting, some cupping, and a bit of warping. So often you're gonna have to balance which defect you're gonna sort of pay more attention to, the biggest defect. The reason I say that is that sometimes if you have a board cupped this way and your board is warped this way, you need to decide which way am I gonna push it to through. When you are pushing it through the joiner, you want to support the board as much as possible with its own surface. So if it's got a cup in it, you wanna push it so that the bottom of each edge of the board is downside. Because what happens is if you put it cupped this way, that board is gonna start rocking back and forth like that because there's no support on each edge. That's the same as when the board is warped along its length. You want the front and the back supported as much rather than the center of the board because you want to start trimming off the bottom of each side and eventually as you push it more and more through the jointer, it will start to flatten out and you'll eventually get that flat surface. So again, um, you just need to compromise as well as with twisting. When it's twisted, you need to support one of each sides. The twist is kind of the same whether it's up or down. You want to pay attention to that, the cupping and then also the bowing. So I'll go ahead and I'll get started. And once I run it through a couple times, I'll show you what's taken off. And then after I've uh, shown you what's taken off, then I'll move on to the actual technique of pushing it through.
So you can see the first couple times I've ran it through, this was a low spot, so it took off that one. And then that side originally, because of the twisting, this side was trimmed out. But then with the second pass, it ended up taking a lot more off. So I'll just keep going through and eventually we'll have a bottom uh, flat board. And then I'll get to the technique. When you're pushing the board through the jointer, you want to be conscious of the technique you're using. Now, as you first start pushing the board through, if it's longer than the bed of the uh, jointer, it's going to want to tip down. So you're going to want to put a downward pressure on it. And the reason that is, well, obviously, so the board doesn't tip back, but then also as well, even if it is a shorter board, you want to be able to support that. Because if you just push it right through, the board has a tendency to sort of jump up and down and chatter on the front edge. So you just want to keep that pressure down and then you keep put the pressure down on the infeed side. And then once you get past that cutter head, you're going to transfer the weight, the downward pressure to the front of the board again. And then you keep pulling it through. And as you're pulling it through, you're going to have a sense of where, how far back the board is and you can start to ease up on that pressure and then when you're putting it through the middle section after say the first quarter or last quarter of the board you can you just want to push the board through like that you don't want to put a downward pressure in the middle part because what happens is if you have a board that's bowed and you keep pushing that board down it's going to keep that bow in the board and you're just going to keep running it through the jointer and you're going to keep that convex shape. So ease up on that pressure and then just guide it through the back this way, pushing it forward. Let the cutter heads do their work. Let them take that load. And then as you start to get near the end of the board, you're again going to start transferring and pushing that downward uh, pressure on the board so that it doesn't tip forward. and it, prevents that chattering of the back of the board. And then once you're done, you just take it back, check your board, see if you need to run some more passes. Once it's straight, you know that you've done that one side and then you can do the edge. And once you do that edge, it's the same way. You gotta check to see whether it's, uh, if it's got uh, that bow in it. Sorry, it's not the bow, but uh, crowning I think. So then you're gonna to have to make sure that the downside is on it. This board is pretty straight, so I'm just gonna push it through as is because I think it's good. Yeah, it's pretty straight, so I can just push it right through. And it's the same technique as at the bottom of the board. And uh, I'll go ahead and get started and you can see that and uh, see what the results look like. Now that I've done the uh, flat surface of the board, I'm going to tip it over up on its edge and I'm going to use that newly jointed face and push it up against the fence. 
Now, before I run it through, I'm going to make sure that I'm putting it so that the bow side is down, so each edge is kind of a low point. So, and I'm going to use a very similar technique to the way I ran it on, on the face side. The only difference is that as I'm pushing it in, in addition, I want to keep the flat side of the board up against the fence. So I'm going to want to put a pressure this way as well so that I get a 90 degree angle. Because if I just kind of let it loose and put the top pressure, that board's going to tip out and I'm not going to have an even 90 degree uh, edge along the length. Now that I've uh, jointed the face for, and the edge, I'm just going to double check to make sure that I got a 90 degree angle. Yeah, looks perfect. So I know now when I am gluing my boards together, it's going to be a perfectly flat tabletop. The depth of cut is going to depend on the material and the width of the board you're putting through. If it's a soft wood such as pine, you can usually do a deeper cut. If it's a harder wood, you're going to want to do a shallower cut. Again, the wider the board, the less shallow of a cut you're going to do. You're going to also have to be conscious of the machine that you're using. If it's got a high horsepower motor in it, you can obviously do a deeper cut. But if it's a very small, low horsepower jointer, you're going to want to take much shallower passes. When you're pushing your board through the jointer and as well running it through the planer, you're going to have to be careful about what your grain direction is on your board. As you can see here, the grain is coming back. I've just drawn it in. So you push the board in this way and that'll reduce the amount of chip out or tearing or poor quality finish after you've finished running it through the jointer or the planer. So you can see if you're pushing it through this way, this will cause considerable amount of tear out in your board. Now, sometimes if you have a highly figured wood, the direction of the grain will change and you'll just have to do what's best and gives the least amount of tear out or fuzziness. Luckily, I have a, a spiral cutter head, so it really does reduce the amount of chip out compared to a regular uh, straight knife setup. I've just spent the last four hours jointing those boards and I'm ready to move on to the planer now. Similar to the jointer, you're going to want to use some rollers to support both the front and the back if, if need be for your project. Now I'm going to just set them on the bed, adjust the cutter, cutter head depth, and then from there when I push them into the planer and then also when I take them out of the planer, I'm going to uh, support them with my hands so they don't tip. Now, often with a planer, you will get snipe in the front or the back of the boards. And what that is, is just a slight groove when that cutter head first starts cutting into those boards. And there are some ways to reduce it or possibly eliminate it. Um, what the are basically is, you can start by putting the board in at a bit of an angle. The next thing you could do is put boards one after another repeatedly so they have a constant flat surface that the rollers are pulling it through. 
And another thing is to lift up on the board slightly on the in, when it first goes in, and then when it comes out. I'll show those techniques just as I'm pushing them through the planer and you can get a much better idea of that. Sometimes you're going to have skipping when you're planing your boards or sometimes it'll, it won't go through and you have to really push hard on the board to get it through. Often what that's a result of is that your roller is gummed up or it's got debris or something in it. So as, as you can see here, there's a little bit of debris just along here and there's actually little spots of sap in here. So what happens is when that board's coming through, the roller slips and it sort of jumps. On my infeed side, you can see that there is a bunch of gunk within those metal rollers. Now, not all planers will have this metal roller, but if you do, you're going to want to clean this side as well. Typically on the rubber roller side, I'll just use a rag with, there's a little bit of mineral spirits on there. So I just give it a light wipe and I just get that cleared up in that rubber uh, bare so that when it does make contact with the board, it's going to prevent uh, that slipping that I was talking about. Now your planer might not, you might not be able to access it from the top, but instead you'll just lower that, the bed and turn or unplug it, of course, and then you'll just have to wipe it from the bottom. And if you can't get it completely, you might have to just plug it back in, turn it back on, and then let that roller spin again. Spin again. Now on the metal side I just have a metal brush here that I can use and I'll just go back and forth and just clear out some of that sap and that debris and I'll end up rolling this a few times and I'll completely clear that out and then I'll get started back on planing. Another possibility is that your planer bed is dirty. Now I just get some mineral spirits again, just give it a light wipe off if there's any sap marks or any gum or buildup. Once I've done that and wiped it off, I'll just use some paste wax, give it a, a light coat and then buff it off and then that should uh, help smooth that board going across. You can use any brand. I have some Minwax here. Whatever brand you have on hand is going to work just fine. And then just get a rag and buff it off and you're ready to go. And finally, it's the last side of the board. So we put it through the planer and now we have an S4S material that we can use for our project. Well, that pretty much wraps up the video. Thanks for watching and I look forward to any comments or questions that you might have. And we'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.